Daniel chapter 6. So here's kind of the issue. Like, I think everybody in here knows the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And I'm fixing to read this story to you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and challenge you to think about some of these constructs in maybe a slightly different way. Uh, because I think that there is some wisdom here that we, we, we enjoy the story so much we sort of gloss over. So I'm not going to be in a hurry to get through all 28 verses. I'm not, but I think that we can get through all 28 verses because, again, it's not deep theology. It is a message God's trying to deliver. So I'm going to read through the message as best I can. There are three points to the message, but I, I really had six, and I kind of whittled them down. So <clears throat> Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole region. So here's the thing. You read verse 1, you say, okay, well, what is a satrap? A mayor. Well, so it gets a little more complicated. If you, if you read King James or New King James, governor is the next thing we get. So we get satraps, then we get governors. So it's, it's a loose affiliation with city structure. So all we really know in this particular instance right now is that Darius was the, the, the king over a vast empire, and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had been taken off into captivity, and uh, they are now serving the king in this particular instance. So in this instance, we know that Daniel is already elevated into a position of power and authority where he is serving. Well, we don't know that, but in the next verse we're going to get there. So verse 2. And over these three, and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. So if you said governors for the satraps, what does it say for the governors? Okay. So a civil structure. So we have a civil structure here in this particular instance, and the civil structure is established. And I thought this was, this was peculiar. It is not so that the king would incur great gain, but they were actually given the instructions that the king would suffer no loss. So think about the city structure in, in the grander context. That's not how we usually view mm, American culture. Like, uh, it is the city's goal to aspire to make sure they collect enough taxes so that they have a surplus so they can pay all of their employees, they can pave the streets, they can have the water running and all of those things like we enjoy here in Linden. Amen? <laughs> Jokes, because if you've ever been to Linden, you know our city streets are not really very well paved. <laughs> We're working on it. Verse 3. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. Continuing in verse 3. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Now, I love this part of the story, and, and we don't put a lot of attention on it, but notice here that Daniel's not aspiring to be over anybody else, but the king is appointing him where he is supposed to serve, and he's just doing such a good job. Everywhere he goes, the king suffers no loss. He enjoys the honesty and the integrity of Daniel, and he, he elevates him into positions of power and authority to the point where we are told we have three governors and we have 120 satraps. So we have a city structure, and the king, the king is thinking he shall go ahead and set Daniel over the whole thing. I don't know what the king is planning on doing. I guess maybe he's planning on just taking it easy. But what we see here is not that Daniel is aspiring to greatness, but because it said he had an excellent spirit within him, and we'll find out as we continue to read through the story, that excellent spirit is to serve God. And that spirit shines through wherever Daniel goes. I love that because, ladies and gentlemen, when you're looking for inspiration and you start reading here and you get to verse 3, it's like, okay, so all I really need to do is let the God that's inside of me show, and then things get better. It's encouraging. No matter how bad your day is going, you can read this and go, okay. Daniel wasn't aspiring to do better or to be better. Daniel was aspiring to serve God to the best of his ability, and people noticed. Verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, continuing in verse 4. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Now, if you go from verse 3 to verse 4, you can see here that Daniel hadn't asked the king for anything, but other people noticed that Daniel was receiving favor. 
And not only did they notice that he was receiving favor, they were a little bit concerned that Daniel was going to receive more favor and he was going to have more power and more control. And what they decided to do, and this is, whoo, human nature doesn't change very much. What they decided to do was not emulate Daniel. They didn't want to be better themselves. They wanted to catch Daniel doing something wrong. Isn't that just human nature still in the world today? Like, okay, I'll catch somebody doing something wrong. Isn't that how every political election is run every two or four years, regardless of how it goes? They don't want to talk about the things that they're doing well. They want to talk about the things that their opponent are doing wrong. But if you want to be elevated to a position of power and authority, if you follow the example of Daniel here, he didn't talk bad about anybody. He was just doing what was right according unto God, and then he was being rewarded for it. So here the people see that Daniel is about to be rewarded again, and they decide, okay, we have to do something about that. Verse 5. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Think about that for a second. Think about what a great statement that makes to the character of Daniel. That They just go ahead and say, we've tried to find Daniel doing something wrong and we can't find him doing anything wrong. So if we're going to get him in trouble, we're going to have to make sure we use his own religion against him. And then think about that thought for a second. Daniel's religion can't be used against him, but man's religion could. <laughs> you see, if Daniel, is doing, if Daniel is doing his best to honor God in all that he does, how do you turn that into a bad quality? Oh, look at that man. He honors God too much. You can't trust him. But that's what they've decided they're going to do. They're going to catch Daniel doing something that honors God that, that will get him into trouble. But, well, let's go to point one. Live like it matters to God. And that's all Daniel was doing. He was living like it mattered to God. And if you know the story of Daniel, he wasn't living in the comfort of his own home to the glory of God. He had been taken off into captivity and into slavery. And yet still... In his most trying times, he wanted to honor God. And that had elevated him to a position of power and authority, almost unequaled in the entire kingdom. Verse 6. So these governors and the satraps thronged before the king, and they said thus to him, King Darius, live forever! Exclamation point. So all the people show up to see the king, and they just start complimenting the king. Verse 7. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, they have consulted together and they have established a, a royal statute, continuing in verse 7. And to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now I want to go back to the beginning of verse 7 here because I want you to see here, this wasn't just a couple of people that decided this. It looks like everybody's on board. And I want you to think about that because if everybody is on board against Daniel, what do we really have to complain about when we're blessed with such a wonderful Christian family like this? That we know we can depend on, that we can trust, that we can ask for help, that, that we can receive love and encouragement from. In this particular instance, Daniel had been taken off into captivity. He was away from his homeland. He was away from his family. All he had was those that had survived into captivity, and he's doing what he is supposed to do for the king, and everybody has, has decided Daniel is doing so well, let's see if we can get him into trouble. I know that's kind of thinking about it the wrong way because you're looking for encouragement, so you want to see something good in here, but actually what you see is that, you know what? No matter how well you try and do your best, there are going to be some people who are just against you. And it was all of the people, and it was all of the people in positions of power and authority. So I don't care what you have had to conquer in your own lifetime, but in this particular instance, you can see here that Daniel truly did have an entire government against him. Everybody below the king, anyway. <laughs> Verse 8. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. That's a foreign concept to us today. 
because it doesn't matter what, what you actually write in law, there's going to be a lawsuit and something's going to change. Or the Supreme Court said something in 1973 and they said something different in 2022. Hmm. We're accustomed to living in a world where there's really no constant except change. So in this particular moment, he's saying, I want you to sign this thing that honors you, O king. We've all got together. We've all just decided that you have done such a great job that we want you to be honored by everybody. We want you to understand that everyone is going to just reverence you for the next 30 days. You've been so good and so kind and so smart and so gracious. We just want to honor you, not just for a little while, but for a whole month. We want everybody to do nothing but just honor you. Point two. Do that again. Okay. The devil always makes it sound good. Doesn't he? All of the governors, all of the satraps, all of the prefects, all of the counselors, all of everybody has come together and said, Oh, king, you're so smart and so wise and so glorious. We want you to pass a decree that only you can be honored for an entire 30 days. The devil just has thousands of years of practice at telling us what it is we want to hear. And we have a lifetime of experience of just falling for it over and over and over again. We can read about it all during the week. We can study about it on Sunday morning. And then on Monday morning, when this comes up, we're thinking, well, I've never seen that before. That sounds like a great idea. Take you back to this morning's message, right? Sarah thought that would be a great idea. So did Abraham. Didn't work out so well. We're still suffering for it today. Verse 9. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Verse 10. We're going to speed through some of these. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, what did he do? Continuing in verse 10. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom since early days. Think about that for a second. The law changed. Daniel did not. Daniel was just continuing to do what he had been doing basically his entire adult life. He was taking time three times a day to go into his room that had a window that faced towards Jerusalem. He was on his knees and he was praying to God. This is one of those, I'm trying not to get political. We're going on to verse 11. <laughs> then these men assembled and they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. The same way he had done the day before. The same way had they left him alone, he would have continued to do the next day. So these people finally think that they've caught Daniel because what they have done is they've tricked the king into making sure that Daniel could not pray to anybody other than him. And Daniel, knowing full well that the decree had been signed, it says that he did, he went into his room, he opened his windows, he knelt down, faced Jerusalem, and he prayed three times that day, praising God. And I wonder what is the message that God's trying to give us here in reference to how we interact with our government. Do we allow our religion to be monitored twisted or changed based on the political situation at the time? Or do we live our lives in a way that honors God and regardless of what the government says, we continue to honor God in that same way? <clears throat> and it's not to the point where we're going to be thrown into the lion's den. It's not there yet. But it seems kind of close. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that long ago they were telling us we couldn't even open our doors because if you have more than 10 people, you might catch a cold. Sorry, a virus. It's, I'm trying not to be political. <laughs> Forgive me. Verse 12. And they went before the king, and they spoke concerning the king's decree. Now, I love this part. So they went to the king, and they said, oh, you're such a smart guy. We just want to praise you for 30 days. Would you go ahead and sign this so it can't possibly be changed? And he thought, sure, I'll do that. And now they've come back to the king. And I love how the difference in the conversation actually took place here. Continuing in verse 12. 
They asked the king, Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? They know very well that he signed it. He knows very well that he signed it. He signed it because they came to him and said, Hey, we want you to sign this. Now, instead of going back and saying, Oh, king, look what we found. They're saying, Oh, king, did you do this? This was your idea, right? You're responsible for this now because you've signed it. And let's just be honest, ladies and gentlemen, in today's mm, litigious society, once you sign it, yeah, you own it. <laughs> Continuing in verse 12. The king answered and said, This thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. They said, King, did you sign this? He said, Yes, I did. Really, Callum? <laughs> Verse 13. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, that Daniel, who was one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard to you, O king. Do you think that they ever described Daniel like that before that moment? Wouldn't it have been Daniel the governor? <laughs> Daniel, that one that you've placed in charge, you know, Daniel, one of those guys in authority, they wouldn't have said Daniel, you know, one of those captives. But in this particular instance, they've got him. So how are they describing him? In the worst possible context. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I still see this so often in political ads. I'm wondering if we're ever going to learn. That when someone gives you a person's name with something derogatory right behind it, they're trying to influence you. Continuing in verse 13. Oh, for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Oh, that Daniel, you know, one of those captives, he's paying no attention to that thing you signed. You know, that thing that you signed that can't be changed. He's not, not only is he disregarding it, but he's disregarding it three times a day. He's not just being a little bit ornery. He's being full-blown just, oh, he's thumbing his nose at you, king. This is terrible. How can you let him get away with this? Verse 14. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. I love this response from the king here. In this instance, the king, it says that He's greatly displeased with himself. Why? Because he signed it. Why did he sign it? Because they gave it to him and encouraged him to. I think he's displeased with himself because he knows those people that are in positions under him just manipulated him. And they just got him to do what it was they wanted him to do. And he's displeased. So what is he going to do? He's going to show them. He's going to take it upon himself. He's going to find some way so that he can deliver Daniel. Continuing in verse 14. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He worked on it all day. Somebody find me a loophole. Somebody find me an attorney. Somebody find me a judge. Somebody find me somebody who will sign this so that I can do this so that it will offset that. He labored all day until the going down of the sun. And at the end of the day, they knew they had got him. So they come back and they say, O king. Then these men approached the king and they said to the king, continuing in verse 15. Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Now they're telling the king what he has to do. Earlier it was, oh, king, you're so wise and you're so smart and you're so great. We just want you to sign this thing so that all we can do is just honor you for 30 days. And they catch Daniel doing what they knew Daniel would, would do, which was just honor his God. I wish people thought that highly of me, by the way. <laughs> Don't you think that? Wouldn't that be great? If I could just catch Brittany doing something wrong, oh, I've got to find some kind of rule she's going to break in church. I don't know. Oh, Kyle's doing such a great job. We're just going to have to catch him doing... We've got we to look at those Ten Commandments again. Look at those 700 laws. Maybe we can find something. Wouldn't it be great if they just looked at us as Christians, not as just weird people, but as people who honor God with everything that we are? 
even if the laws changed. Verse 16. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, continuing in verse 16, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Now, this tells us a lot about King Darius here. It really does. It tells us that Darius isn't necessarily a servant of our God. How do we know? Because he says, your God whom you serve, not our God whom we serve. But the great thing about this is Darius might not serve God, but he understands how powerful God is. How does he understand how powerful God is? Because he's been dealing with Daniel. Think about that for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to convince someone how powerful God is, live your life like it matters. And let them see in you that your God can do great things. Now, I don't know if Darius is hopeful at this moment. I wasn't there at that moment in time. I don't know if he's just trying to encourage Daniel. I I, I don't know why he said this, but I know this is what he said. He says that your God will deliver you. When you're feeling down, isn't that really what you need to hear? Mm-hmm. Deep down, isn't that that's what you want somebody to tell you? Hey, God's got this. You're going to be okay. And that's what Darius, let's just say a pagan, says to Daniel. Verse 17. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. Continuing in verse 17. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Did anybody else have any ideas? Anything Darius could have done to save Daniel? We got one that says pardon. Pardon. Pardons weren't apparently allowed by the Medes and the Persians. Once you're, convic- you're convicted, you're dead. Okay. Anybody else? Kyle, what would you do if you wanted to save Daniel? He's going to get thrown in the lion's den. Give him a shotgun? Uh-huh. I always just wondered. I really did. This is, I've wondered this since I was probably Kyle's age. Why didn't he just take the lions out? <laughs> Why not just move the lions? Like, if you really want to save this guy, you said you were going to throw him into the lion's den. Well, you've done that. But that's not what God wanted us to learn. He didn't want us to learn that there's a way to get around the law. What he wanted us to learn was to trust God through the law. So they threw Daniel into the lion's den, and then they put a stone on the mouth of the lion's den, and then they sealed it just so in case anybody came along and thought, hey, there's a big stone there, let me pick it up. They would see this little wax ring and go, oh, no, we can't do that. Verse 18. Now the king went to his palace and he spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. So the king goes back to his palace and he's so upset about the fact that his friend Daniel is going to be eaten by these lions that he doesn't even eat his dinner. And the traditional music that's played for the king at the end of the day, that that traditional music is not played. And then when he goes off into his room where he's supposed to just rest in his bed and get a good night's sleep in his silk sheets, he can't even do that because he's just consumed with worry for his friend Daniel. So we see here that Daniel's definitely had an impact in Darius' life because Darius is concerned. Remember, he worked all day long to try and find that loophole. And when he couldn't find that loophole, he told Daniel not to worry about it, that his God was going to save him. And then he threw him in. And then he went home and he wouldn't eat and he wouldn't sleep. Verse 19. Then the king rose very early in the morning and he went in haste to the den of lions. He couldn't sit there awake any longer. It's very early in the morning. I don't know if he waited for sunrise. I don't know exactly when they considered the morning was. So all I do know is that he he didn't wait until it was late in the day to go and check on Daniel. At his first earliest opportunity, he rushes to the den to see what's happened to his friend Daniel. Verse 20. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke to Daniel, saying, saying to Daniel, Daniel, 
servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continuously, been able to deliver you from the lions? That's a little bit different than the night before when he says, Daniel, it's okay, your God's going to save you, right? What we see here is that, that Darius actually spoke like he trusted God, but in reality, he had to show up and ask, well, did God do it? Was God able? And this gets me every time. Because when we have those hard days, when we have those hard weeks, when we have those weak moments, that's what we do. We question, can God really get me through this one, this time? Am I going to be able to make it this time? I know God's been with me up until now, but this, whoo, this is terrible. This is bad. And it doesn't even really matter what this is, but when we get to that point of depression in our own personal lives, this is the same question that we as Christians ask of our God. Is God able? And when you need to be encouraged, the answer you need to hear Yes, God is able. Sometimes, yes, I need to be reminded of the things that I have gone through so that I can see how strong and powerful my God is. So I can get my perspective right back in the moment. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not just me. I, I, I think that there are some of you that suffer the same quality. Sometimes it just seems hopeless. Sometimes things just pile up one after another, after another, after another. And you just don't know if you can just handle one more silly little thing. And you ask, is God able to get me through this? Instead of remembering that, yes, he got Daniel through this, instead of remembering how many times he's carried you through the lions, whether or not it was an actual den of lions or whether it was something else, everything that we have gone through in our lives, God has been revealing himself to us. He's been teaching us. He's been showing us. He's been trying to get us to understand that, yes, God is able, so that we would have the ability when we see someone struggling in their struggle, whatever it is, we can look at them and we can say, yes, my God is able. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it through this. I don't know how, I don't know why, but you are going to make it through this. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, a lost and dying world out there that has no experience with our, our God, they need us to say that to them so they can understand that we truly believe. Verse 21. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever! Exclamation point. The king was worried. He showed up as early as he could, and he, he cried out, O Daniel, was your God, whom you serve continually, able to spare you from the lions? And Daniel responds, My best East Texan, heck yeah. <laughs> It's not a story for entertainment. Daniel physically went into the lion's den. He suffered that night there with the lions. He had to be dragged before the king so that they could say, here's this noble man who was praying. Now kill him. He went through these things so that we could look at this story and we can know that our God is able. And we don't have to question whether or not our God is able or whether or not our God is willing. All we have to do is just continue to serve God, knowing full well that you don't stay here that long anyway. You don't. God has a better place reserved for us, and when he calls us home, that's our reward. Why are we so offended that we might actually get rewarded? Because we haven't finished what we want to do yet. Because we're not living our lives to the glory of God, but we're living our lives to our personal glory. There's something left I want to accomplish. Don't take me yet, Lord. I want to see this one thing. I've got to be honest, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see heaven. I do. I want to see angels. I want to know how they tell time in heaven. Just curious. One of those things. 
You think anybody in heaven wears a watch? <laughs> I don't think so, but you know, we'll spend a lot of time on watches here on earth, right? Rolex has made quite a mint out of it. <laughs> We're all worried about time. God's worried about our souls. Verse 22. Huh? My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. Now this is really key here. Daniel is telling us, yes, God is able. And he's telling us why God did it. And as a young man, I could read through the story of Daniel and go, oh, that's great. So I can do all of these things and God's going to protect me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, of course God can. And of course he did because I lived my life to honor God. Continuing in verse 22. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Of course God can save me. And he did. And he did because I have done no wrong before him and I have done no wrong before you. And there's a teachable moment here that we could probably do an entire hour on. But ladies and gentlemen, isn't this incredibly different than the way we interact with our God? We think God should do something glorious for us because. Why? <laughs> Have you lived innocent before your fellow man? Have you lived to completely honor God before your fellow man? Well, no, nobody does that. So I've just, I've, I, was, I was better than so-and-so. So-and-so did not save Daniel. God did. We're not measured against so-and-so. In this particular instance, Daniel says, yes, God is powerful enough to do this. And let me tell you why he did it. He did it because I have lived my entire life to honor him. And he did it because, O oh, king, I have done no wrong to you. Now, that's a heck of a standard to try and live up to, isn't it? <laughs> What we're going to do is we're going to leave here tonight and we're going to say, okay, from now on, I'm going to do no wrong before God and I'm going to do no wrong before man. And by the time we get to the car, we've, we've pretty much decided that's just not going to happen. <laughs> but that's how Daniel was living his life. And that's why God honored his sacrifice. Verse 23. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. Who do you think signed up for that job? <laughs> I'll go down and get him. I worry about stuff like that because really and truly, think about it for just a second. Don't you want to know when you start thinking about it, how did they get him out? Did they throw down a ladder? Were there stairs? Was there a door they could open he just snuck out? I mean, he was there all night long, so then I start to wonder, okay, if he's there all night long and they get him out in the morning, how did they actually get him out? Who's going to volunteer to say, hey, you know what, I'll go down, it'll be okay, the lions are they're, they're acting fine. Sorry, my mind works like that. In all of the Baptist material that I've seen, they throw a rope down. I don't know if that's how it worked or not, I don't know. Makes a little bit of sense, because i got to be honest, I'm not volunteering to go down there to get Daniel out. But I'll pull the rope up. Continuing in verse 23. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatsoever was found on him, because he believed in his God. There's the exclamation point. Daniel didn't honor the king because he liked the king. He honored the king because he believed in his God. Daniel didn't live his life to impress his neighbors. He lived his life because he believed in his God. And when you read through this story, and you just go, this man, this is a really good story. Are we missing the point of the story being that this is one of those times when we have the ability to self-evaluate, am I living my life to this standard? A am I living my life to this glory? Do I have the same potential to be spared from the lion's den, or am I just, whoo, I'm just, whoo, that's just not going to work for me. 
Do you believe in your God enough <laughs> to face the lions? And then I started to think, okay, so what trials have I gone through? What trials have God entrusted that I could handle? In my opinion, I've had some pretty big ones. But I never had to sleep with lions. So then I started thinking, you know what? I can do better. I can try a little bit harder to make sure that I'm living my life not to dishonor any man and to make sure that I'm completely honoring God. I, I can actually try a little harder. And then I started to think, when I started writing this message, it was because I was depressed. And now I'm inspired. And then I just like God to give you just what you need in the moment to get to the next moment. Mm -hmm. Verse 24. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. It wasn't just that they cast them into the den of lions. Continuing in verse 24, they cast them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them, and they broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. So this is one of those things where you start to start to really self-evaluate. Okay, so in this particular instance, Daniel's wife's, I'm sorry, the men who accused Daniel's wives suffered and their children suffered. So then what you start to see, ladies and gentlemen, is it's important to make sure you're the child of a godly man and to make sure you're the spouse of a godly person. <laughs> It doesn't say that the children had done anything wrong, but what had they done wrong? They had not honored God. How do we know? Because their parents didn't honor God. So then as a spouse, Jill, you okay? All right, you, I make sure you're honoring God because I don't want to. <laughs> so much trouble. <laughs> we really have. One of those was I was not supposed to call her out in church. <laughs> I apologize. Next week. Kylie. Yes. How are you doing? Because I don't want Brandon to get thrown in the lion's den either. Oh, dang. I was thinking the other way. Now i got to self-evaluate. You have to self-evaluate. Like, Brandon's good, so I'm good. Okay. All right. So then Callum. Uh -oh. We don't want Callum to throw, be thrown in the lion's den, so we have to make sure that his parents are honoring God. So you see here how God has just taken our perspective, and, and he says, okay, it's not just about you. It's about living your life for the glory of God. Not only is it not just about you, but it's also about the spouse, and it's also about the kids. So we have to make sure that everyone is living the, their life to honor God, or they can end up in the lion's den. And then if you say, okay, we're, let's just talk spiritually here. So let's just not talk about actual lions. Let's talk about the troubles that we have in this world. So we know that we do have trouble in this world, and we know that our spouses have trouble in this world because we have trouble, and we know that our kids have trouble in this world because we have trouble. So what can we do to see to it that our spouses and our kids don't have trouble? And the answer was exactly the same, honor God. So now it becomes important for us to think about, okay, what am I doing so that I can make sure that my spouse is doing what he or she needs to do so I can make sure that my kids are doing what they need to do? And what was the answer? It was exactly the same, honor God. So when we look out into a lost and dying world and we think, whoo, they need a lot of help, what are we supposed to do? Honor God. When people say, well, what are we going to do to change the world? Honor God. How do I know? That's all Daniel did, and it changed this world. How do I know? Because they went into the lion's den, their spouses went into the lion's den, their kids went into the lion's den, and then the king makes this decree. Verse 25, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all of the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. Continuing in verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Continuing in verse 26, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. Verse 27, he delivers and he rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Daniel changed an entire kingdom. 
because he honored God. And we act like we don't know what we can do to save Texas, Linden, Atlanta, America. All Daniel did was live his life to honor God, and it affected everybody. So if we can look out and see, whoo, they sure need some help, what do we do? We honor God. Verse 28. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. What did Daniel do to change his world? He honored God. What did he do after he honored God? It didn't spare him from the trials, lady. He still went to the, the lion's den. After he had gone through the trials, he continued to honor God, and it says he prospered. Point number three. <laughs> Thank you. We're supposed to serve God and let him handle the lions. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to get through Daniel chapter 6. I pray, dear God, it inspires us. I pray, dear God, that it encourages us. I pray, dear God, that it carries us through whatever the trial is that we're currently in so that we have the ability to see and know, dear Lord, that just simply honoring you makes the difference. Amen. Amen.